to the meeting tonight. My name is Faye Shanty. I'm the, as many of you know, the president of the American Meteorological Society here at CRD. Um, I just have a couple announcements to run through with everybody um, on some upcoming seminars that are approaching and quickly. Um, from April 4 to 6, we have the Severe Storms and Doppler Radar Conference. Valpo's Great Lakes Posium is the Great Lakes Meteorology Conference. That's on March 23rd, if you guys are interested in that. The Severe Weather Seminar, Tom Skilling himself, little birdie flew in my ear and said it was April 6th when he'll be at Fermilab. Don't quote me on that, but that's what I heard from him. So if you guys are interested Can in going to Fermilab, what? Can we're <laughs> quote me then. <laughs> um, so if you are interested in that, that is coming up soon. Keep an eye out. I definitely want to go this year. And then, last but not least, registration for spotter training is last day to register is March 1st. The actual spotter training is on March 16th. Oh, yeah, March 16th, spotter training means students find those, that's extra credit, big extra credit. That one is good. So you need that. Um, I'm going to pass around just a sheet if you guys would just sign and which sex, section you're in, if you weren't my students, if you're not my student. I don't care. Yeah. Well, if you're my past student. You're my past student? No, I forgot your name. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I had one more thing. Mike Zeransky is giving a presentation on dual poll the, the last week in February. So it's either going to be the 28th or the 26th. Um, we will send you an email shortly once we decide the date and let you know. So if you're interested in learning more about dual poll, come out to that as well. Mike promise it's going to be an amazing demonstration. Amazing. Interactive, I think. Amazing. So, and we are all here tonight for Tammy Souza. She is um, from Fox News. She's going to be giving a presentation about broadcasting meteorology and what she does in that field. Um, enlighten us for people who want to go into broadcast meteorology on what exactly it entails. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause to Pat Sketch? He was the one who arranged this whole thing. And it was awesome of him to do so. So if we can give another round of applause to Tammy Suzanne. Let her take it from here. Thank you for having me. I've actually been out here several times before. I did a couple of stories. Where did he go? Oh, there he is. Oh, you're over there. Like in the middle. Uh, I did some stories on storm chasing, and I found it to be fascinating. And you, you have an amazing program out here. We were just discussing this over dinner. And I've always thought you should be having your own Fermilab trial thing. You should be having your own conferences here um, and inviting people in high school and college and professionals like myself. Um, to come to it because you have a lot to offer. You have a lot of smart people and you have one of the best websites uh, anywhere. I can tell you there's people nationwide. I, I was the head of the AMS board nationally, so I oversaw like the seal process for all the meteorologists nationwide. Um, and I know a lot of them. And I would say that your site is bookmarked by other people. I know everybody in my department has a bookmark. Everybody at NBC does. I know Skilling uses it. I don't know who, well, who they use at ABC, but I would suspect the same thing at CBS too. So, um, anyway, I've been here in the Chicago area basically since 2000. I was in Milwaukee from '97 until 2000, uh, and then I came here and I worked at ABC for six years and then Fox about two and a half years, and then I took a jog down to Tampa and uh, I was a chief down there, and I love that in hurricane country. Didn't like Florida so much. I, I think it's really fun to visit, but I think you shouldn't live where you like to vacation. And for family reasons and just a myriad of other reasons, I had the opportunity to come back here and I wanted to. I love this area and I love forecasting here. So this is fun. I am a broadcast meteorologist. Um, some people say meteorologist, um, but I do like to think I'm a meteorologist too. Um, I went to San Diego State and UCSD and I have my undergraduate degree in biology and environmental science, I have oceanography, and and I did the Mississippi State program. I traveled back and forth and there and here because at the time I was working, and it's very hard to get uh, another degree, especially in meteorology, if you're working 
in the field at the time. I already had a lot of background. I had my pilot's license, and I understood quite a bit. I just didn't have the actual piece of paper. So I've done <clears throat> all of that, and then we were discussing master's program, and you all need a master's program here, too. Okay. You can just skip by the two-year thing and go right to the, uh, the extra year. Um, anyway, so that's, that's sort of who I am. I'm very fortunate. I, I have all of my seals, my CBM seal, NWA, my original AMS. Um, so I've actually had to take at least two tests for general knowledge, so I do know something. The low is the lousy weather and the H is the happy weather. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, Maybe you, could you explain the SEAL process for maybe some of the other students? That oh, I will, yeah. Basically, a, a lot of people that are uh, broadcasters on television, you see the SEAL that's displayed down below? Now they have two AMS SEALs, you'll see. There's one that just says AMS, and that's the original AMS SEAL. Um, for that one, you basically had to be uh, in a, a broadcaster on television for no, a certain number of years, I think it was two years at least, and then you had to uh, have college courses that would uh, show that you were educated in meteorology, geoscience, atmospheric science, and then you actually had to send in your tapes and have it reviewed um, by a panel of peers. That was the panel that I oversaw as well. And um, then you would get your seal. And a lot of people were rejected. It's like a 50% get their seal and then 50% don't. Then you have to keep trying until you do. NWA, National Weather Association, has the same thing. Um, the National Weather Association seal, <clears throat> you always had to take a test for, a written test. And then it's the same process. You had to send in what education you have and send in tapes and, and so forth. Um, and the AMS is upgraded now. They started doing this back in like 2005, I think. Um, where you had to actually take a test before a certain deadline. And if you want to see procrastination, you should see somebody in my field procrastinating to take a test after they've been working in meteorology for years. And it's not an easy test. I just sat on the committee to revamp the questions on the test. This test is a scary thing. I'm glad I'm not taking it again. <laughs> I kept saying that, really? Do we have to put that one? Can we go back to like, uh, you know, 850 millibar level or something? They came up with, they came up with questions that were so phenomenally difficult. There's a pool of 600 questions, I believe, 600. <clears throat> and it's, it's, you know, it's just a kind of, when you go to take the test, it's, they all kind of load in. So you don't know which of the questions you're getting. You have to get 75% on the test. It covers a whole bunch of fields, everything from tropical to radar. I mean, you're, you're dealing with photographs, you're dealing with spaghetti models, you're dealing with simple things like, you know, sea breeze. That's pretty easy to figure out. But you're dealing with a lot more complicated upper atmospheric stuff as well. And it's, it's a fairly fairly difficult test to take. And I think everybody was very frightened to take the CBM test, the meteorologist on air. And uh, because they, they heard you have to study, study the comet modules and everything. You should have to study and study and study for this. You have to know everything. And you really do have to know a lot about everything. But um, they give you two tries right off the bat. You sign up to take it. And they give you two whacks. And if you fail both of those, you have to wait six months. So my philosophy was, I'm just going to take the thing and see how hard it is, and now I'll figure out what I have to actually brush up on, because it had been a while since I had been in college taking any classes. And I was fortunate. I got 85%, so I, I got my, uh, ironically, it was tropics that I could look at that on, and then I went to the tropics. Oh. Anyway, um, so that seal now you have to take a test for and send in um, your tapes. You also have to have a college degree in meteorology or atmospheric science or geoscience for the AMS at this point. And the cutoff came, I got them to extend for another year, basically, for meteorologists that were slow and moving. And I think in Chicago right now, I have a CDM, Brett Miller got his CDM, uh, Tim McGill has a CDM, Mary Ted Kleist has a CDM, Phil Schwartz has a CDM. <coughs> I, don't know if I don't know if Tom bothered getting his, I mean, he's Tom Skilling. <laughs> he has the skilling seal. That's totally different. None of us get that one. Um, if it's AMS, he doesn't. He doesn't do a lot with them. He has he's his not AMS. Really happy with the AMS. No, I, I know, I know. But From but days, but he so. had no. But he has his AMS seal. I just don't know that he bothered to go back and do do the take the test. Um, so anyway, the seal is displayed on television to know to let the public know. Supposedly, this is the idea behind it that you actually have a general knowledge that you have taken classes that you have been approved by a panel that, you know, when you get on the air, they've seen your work, that you do know what you're talking about, <clears throat> unless you're just having a crazy day. And, um, you know, that you're somebody that is trustworthy when it comes to, that's what the SEAL process is. 
and it is kind of a big deal. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, bosses want to see that you have your seal. And I think I think everybody in the Chicago area has at least one seal. Um, I have NWA and the two AMSs. Bill has an AMS. I work with, with Bill Bells. He has an AMS and an NWA, and Mark has an AMS. But I can't I can't think of a meteorologist town that doesn't have one. I don't mean, I don't think there is one. I mean, you're in a place with active weather. It's kind of nice. Would that explain it? Absolutely. So that's sort of a, that's sort of a, for the public a qualification. They also have it for radio, um, so you don't see it displayed, obviously. But they have it. So they have that. Um, so anyway, it's a little bit of a different beast. You actually have to take everything that you know. Did anybody see the movie The Birdcage with Robin Williams? Ever? I love that movie. Okay, you saw it. I guess we're too old. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> there's a point where there's this guy that like wants to do all this crazy dancing and Robin Williams says, no, 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 do it all, but put it in here and just be like this. And that's sort of what it is on television. It's like you sit down for hours and you figure things out. And, I mean, you get to a point where we've had a pretty quiet week when the cold was coming. That's a simple forecast. You can look at everything, boom, 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 and then you have time to go watch one of the movies nominated for a Golden Globe or something. But um, basically, you, you pour over everything. You do all the upper air charts. You look at all the numericals. You look at all the models. You, you check out everything. Um, and then you have to cram it into about two and a half minutes, unless you're Tom, and then you get more time. Or unless you're me, and I go over time, and you yell that afterwards, and I don't care. Um, but that's what you do. And you have to give pretty much as much local perspective, because we're not doing national. The whole thing now with broadcast meteorology is to give a local perspective. Um, you can go to the Weather Channel to see a, well, sometimes, a movie <laughs> or a, a national perspective. Um, and so that, that's kind of what it is. We build our own maps and graphics. We don't have a weather producer at Fox. They don't have one at NBC. Um, I think they, they have somebody that helps out. You know, I, I want to say John still does over at Channel 2. Um, uh, Gian, Tom does, but the reason Tom Stealing does is because he does the whole newspaper page of the Tribune. So all the old weather service guys, when they retire, they don't die, they don't move, they just go to WGN. And they, and they build the weather page for him and help out. So he kind of has his hands full there. Um, and uh, yeah, ABC, they don't have any weather producers. Those are kind of a thing of the past. Uh, there are very few of them. The national shows have them, um, you know, meteorologists behind the scenes because they have to build the weather graphics. And it's a national show. So you're, you're very personality driven. But um, yeah, we do our own stuff, our own forecasting, our own graphics. And I'm a super user on all the weather equipment. We have Barron's and WSI with completely redundant systems. So we have everything that they offer at Fox, which is amazing. Can you believe it? Of all the stations in town, can you believe it's Fox that has all that? I am always still in awe. I would never have bet on that. I would have said it's WGN that has it all or something. But we have so much. And we have a dual pole radar. Uh, we have the first one, but even before the weather service had dual pole. Um, and we do have the most powerful one of any television station in the Midwest. So it's pretty impressive. And I love using it. I've used it on air. I've used dual pole <coughs> data. The thing is, is that a lot of times <laughs> you can't really explain what, what you're looking at, it, you know, succinctly to the public. You're looking at something and you're finding these dots. And, you know, then you're going to get into five minutes of explaining this and your time is already over twice. And, and, you know, so you have to kind of pick and choose and take snapshots of what you're looking at. If you have a chance to go to the dual pole, um, do it. The dual pole is, it is so cool when it, that it can show you the difference between the, the rain droplet sizes and what you're looking for, um, you know, with reference to hail or if it's anything at all, if it's heavy rain, if you're changing over to snow. Uh, the, the popular one now is a debris cloud. Um, but you can, you, you can really see an awful lot um, with this. And so it's pretty amazing. And they're gonna be doing more and more things with it. So that's the future. They actually have something beyond that, but the but the problem is, is that uh, when I'm down to SPC, um, it is so fast that it can't, by the time that it goes through the servers and it is actually all computed, it, it's gone. I mean, uh, the, the, the stuff that the cutting technology that they have uh, for looking at storms and slicing through them is now too advanced for the computers to actually put into something that can be displayed on air. So that's the next, the next step. Um, Anyway, I do love what I do. I like talking. <laughs> I, I, also, I also like reporting on weather things. That's kind of different. A lot of meteorologists don't. They just basically want to sit in there and do their computers and be left alone. And they do leave us alone at the weather station. Make no mistake, the television stations, 
we are like some sort of a magical thing, and they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to learn. They don't want to know what an isobar or a high or a low. They don't want to know about cuthrin. Just go and do it, and you've got three minutes to tell us about it because it's we produce our own stuff. We build our own graphics. We, we're our own writer, producer, editor, um, reporter, the whole thing. We're the only person that does everything ourselves in the station. And um, producers love that. It's like a three-minute show. Go away. Do it. And they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to do it themselves. Um, and usually when we're in the middle of a weather uh, cast, we're like into it. And we're telling you all about it on the screen. And we're going over it all. And it's really great. Somebody's giving us time cues, a director in our ear. But usually that three minutes is when everybody fixes the newscast. So whatever's gone to pod or the breaking news or they're over here or something has to be rewritten, they're totally ignoring. Because I've actually stopped on the air before knowing they're doing this and said nothing. And there's sheer panic in the control <laughs> I mean, I have watched. I have watched. I have watched their heads snap up because you're silent. Silence and going to black and news is death. So if you're silent, they're like, is "She done? What?" You know. So that's always fun. One time I did that. Um, what, what happened? Anyway, <laughs> did that? They, well, there was a whole like meeting after. Well, why? Why did you do that? Why? Why did you do that? Why did you? Um, I like. Well, I stopped. It was just like a pregnant pause. I just wanted to kind of do it for emphasis. I said a little. It was emphasis for them, but I, I was like, said it was emphasis for the public watching. Because yeah. sometimes it'll be fun to just like stand up there and go, yeah, it's night, and then the word snow appears, and you just pause. <laughs> and we're going to talk about not this, something else instead, <laughs> or the little not sign will come down. But some of that, I mean, there's there's things you do because that's fun. You get to actually, I want to say, perform. You're um, you're you're telling somebody a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So when you're giving your forecast, you want to tell it you want to tell it in a in a manner that is enjoyable, so that they can understand it. There's a lot of brilliant people out there watching the weather, and they they want the technical side of it, but they don't want to be overly technical. So it is again the Robin Williams thing. You take it all, all the technical terms, and you put it in here, and then you just kind of put it out in layman's terms, not stupid terms, layman's. Terms. And you know that that kind of helps people get through. You always try to slide something in there though um, that makes everybody go, "Oh, what's that?" But you don't have a lot of time to do explanations, so you have to be careful with that. Um, but I do like to do reports too, and so I get to do a lot more of them now. I'm I'm generally doing the weekends. I did the mornings at Fox. I did weekends at NBC. I did Monday through Friday nights in Tampa and Milwaukee, um, and now I'm all over the board at Fox. So I do weekends, but I feel. So then the last two weeks I did nights, the last two days I did mornings, I did the uh, weekend mornings before that, so I'm all over. Um, but I do reporting too. So I did storm chasing with Paul and your group out here. Uh, I was the first meteorologist in Chicago, not a meteorologist, person, period, to uh, do a story on, at the time we called it global warming. It was in 2003, I think. Um, it was taboo, nobody was touching it, and I really had to work on NBC. It took them six months to say yes. And I did it, and I uh, worked with uh, Raymond Pierre Humbert at the University of Chicago. And I interviewed a lot of other people. I did a lot of research on it. I loved doing the piece. Um, they let me do this piece, and it was almost four minutes long, which that never happens anymore. And they had such an amazing response. Um, it, you know, and then from there, you know, that's when everybody was really starting to talk about global warming before they correctly called it climate change. And um, from there, then, of course, politics got involved and corporate got involved. And then there, everything was great and there's lots of argument. Now it's kind of come back around full circle where the public is asking questions and they are keenly aware of the fact that there is something going on with the climate. And a lot of experts have gone and done their own research. A lot of uh, universities, they've got out, they've come back and they said, okay, we'll climb aboard. We've had six years, seven years, eight years to do our research and now we're seeing how it is. There's still people that are very much uh, in disbelief of it, but I will tell you straight out, I'm a person. I'm a person that actually has done a lot of research on it, not from a university level, but I have done all my homework as far as reading and talking to people, and I fully believe that there is something very serious going on, and that man has a huge hand in it. So I've done a number of those stories. I actually did fun stories. I went out on Lake Michigan, and I went diving, and I did some stories under the water with a face mask and a microphone down there from shipwrecks. Um, I don't know what else. I, I've done a bunch of weather storm phobe stories, people with storm phobia. So I've, I've, I've got to pick and do a lot of really fun things. I've also um, gone out when there's been tornadoes and stuff, and I've been the first one to report. So I was out at Utica, 
I think I got out there at the same time as Jay Levine, who likes to say he was first, but he wasn't. It was me behind some newspaper reporter. And um, I went down states last year down to Harrisburg and it reported down there after that. So I like doing that. I, I think it's interesting and I think it's nice because if, if you're a meteorologist and you go and you can bring your science to it, but you can tell it in, in, a, in a story as a reporter would, I think it has more value to the public. So, um, so I kind of do a lot of everything. Uh, computer, computers are something we're spending a lot of time on, social media. I mean, you all have Facebook and Twitter accounts, right? Who doesn't? Okay, let's just make it simple. Is anybody in this room not? There you go. Um, that's the new big thing. And what's so funny is all of the news stations are like, you know, five steps behind. I mean, of people that are, are in the, a lot of people that are in the news, especially people in weather, they've already been on Facebook and they've also been tweeting and doing things for some time. But now all the news stations are making it a big deal. They want to own your pages. They want to own your, your Twitter account. They want to tell you what to send out. They want to brand you because they see that this is something that they can actually make money on and publicize everything on. I'm on it today, I think. I work the morning shift, so if I look tired, I've been up since like 2.30 this morning. Um, but I was on this morning, and I don't know how many Facebook things I've been out and Twitter, Twitter hits I put out, just about the cold weather, factoids, people love that, just short things. Sometimes I just put out something crazy too, or I ask questions, just for fun. But that social media is a big deal, and I've given a couple of talks. Last year I talked out at the, the page, I think. Um, um, I talked about social media and the, the uses of social media and how with the severe weather that's actually becoming uh, one way to, to let people know. Do any of you um, know um, in Alabama? James Spann. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was, I'm was i like having a, a brain lapse. Um, James Spann was like one of the first people to do this and now everybody really follows. I mean he's built a following so that within a matter of a couple of minutes he's got a million tweets out. And he's really, he was really credited with actually saving lives during the big tornado outbreak. Um, and that's how valuable it can be. So I go out and I tell people, you know, just, just make a, a, a Twitter group amongst yourselves and maybe some other key things. And all you have to do is don't even, you don't have to tweet your kid or you go to the bathroom or you went shopping or whatever. Just, just tweet when there's something important and you hear it and you can get it out and make a network so everybody will be safe. So that's become a really big thing. And that's something that I'm promoting as much as I can. And I'm pretty active on it. Um, you know, and, and that's, I mean, that's it. The broadcast world is changing rapidly. If you aren't a broadcaster that does meteorology that is willing to adapt to updating, and I write stories for our website all the time. We call it the weather blogs, but there's stories about everything from climate change to, um, you know, snowpack in Poland or, you know, things like that. Um, so if you, you have to be able to do that now. It's not just stepping into the key and doing weather. You have to be able to do your weather that's almost secondary, though, because you've got to do the social media. You have to be able to get out and report. You have to be able to handle stories for the web. Um, so they want you to be able to do more of everything and be more well-rounded. Um, it's fun. Um, the pace sucks when you start out because you start in a really small market and you make less than you would a burger game. Way less. I mean, I'm not even sure they pay minimum wages in some places. I know, I know some people that got jobs for like $13,000 a year starting out in the Dakotas and things. But I call it graduate school that you're paid for. It's a great place to go and make mistakes, lots of mistakes and learn your craft. And they're paying you, and you can supplement it while you're doing that for a year or two and then move on. And then the pay, depending on the market you're in, Wichita, Wichita, Kansas, pays more than many large markets because they actually have a really good economy there and they are very serious about their weather. So market size doesn't matter. I mean, Tampa was lovely, but they pay a little bit in sunshine. Um, you know, Chicago doesn't pay as much as New York or LA or Philly or San Francisco. And it should, but it doesn't. I mean, a lot of people love living in Chicago. So, you know, I mean, the pay is wonderful. Once you've been in it for a while, it's good. Um, but, I mean, for the most part, you have to do it because you love it, because I know teachers that make more money than most meteorologists on air in, in many markets nationwide. So it's something you have to love and then put a public can I say crap? All the crap in the newspaper. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be tweeted out. My boss will call me up. But what do you mean by crap? Um, and so, you know, that, that's kind of where it is. Uh, there's a lot of programs, and I, I've had interns, and they've gone on to Florida State. They've gone on to University of Oklahoma, University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. Um, there's one kid that I kind of mentored to, and um, he, for a while, was. Um, oh, 
What's his name? On Good Morning America. In the morning. The guy that does the weather. Sam Champion. Sam, yeah. yeah. Thank you. God, I'm tired. Um, He's he, not a big he, route, he was, is he? Oh, no, Sam, Sam is. Oh, he is? Yeah. Oh, okay. But, but Sam started out in, like, I think he was born in Kentucky. He started out in Florida, but he just always had a really good look and a good energy, and he wound up. The thing is, is New York is not always the end all and be all. I, I mean, I've had a chance to go there a number of times. I don't want to. A number of people have, that I know have had a chance to go there. If you're not going to make a lot of money to go to New York, it's not worth it because you can't have a decent lifestyle and you certainly can't take a family there. But, I mean, why, if you're not going to go into a national gig or it's not something that you're really passionate about living in New York, why would you want to live in New York? Really? I mean, Atlanta? You could go there and do Weather Channel and you could do some of the CNN stuff there. Um, in Chicago, you, you know, you got you got to have lifestyle along with it too. You can't just chase chase the biggest market and the biggest dollar. But anyway, this kid was his assistant. He he got his master's out of Cornell, and now he's actually working in Cleveland. His very first gig. I'm really proud of him. Um, but you know, everybody kind of has their own path that they take when they get out of college. So um, I was going to open it up to questions because I figured you might have more questions than I have things to say. Is there something else you want me to like specifically hammer well, No, on? I have a lot, but I could do. Well, why don't you have a seat on the floor and probably relax? And, okay. Uh, this would be great, because if you don't, I'll have a thousand. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, and, and, and yeah. For you. And then I'll He's going to grow me. I'm going to be under that desk for about two <laughs> seconds. <laughs> um, but no, I'm happy to answer absolutely anything from, you know, from actually something serious to gossip. So go ahead. Okay, how do you handle the stress when it comes to going on air and stuff? I'm never stressed about going on air. Um, I was when I first started out. I can tell you when I first, the very first weather cast I did in Chico, California, I stood there, my knees were locked together, I stood in front of that screen, I did not move, I just talked. I hit my times, and when I was done, I took a deep breath, I went back to the weather office where my news director promptly called me on the phone to discuss with me that he thought I did a good job, asked how I felt, what I thought I could do better. I didn't turn my microphone off, and neither did the director, and so everybody heard our conversation. On how to <laughs> so that was kind of a learning thing. You never leave the microphone up, ever, ever, ever. Not how many times have we seen on the news somebody caught like this, the gal at CNN? My sister-in-law said a bitch, and the microphone was on. She's in the bathroom, and everybody heard it. Um, so that was kind of learning. Um, but I've had, at first I would be stressed about, oh, I've got to get all this stuff. I have to overbuild. I have to, you know what? Seriously, I'm to the point now where if you just said, okay, we're going to set a box here, and you're just going to pull out five cards, and I'm going to tell you the elements that you have to tell your weather story with. And it may just be like a satellite shot, a radar, uh, a 500 millibar, and you know, maybe a camera outside. Uh, that's fine. I'll arrange them and tell the story with what I have. I've gotten to the point where it's more about the story you're telling. You use the things to tell the story that's going to make sense to people. Um, but I have had lights break over my head and been shattered with glass. I have had the green screen roll up behind me. That was one of them. <laughs> I have had the computer crash and then go to black behind me. Recently, our on-air computer just wants to put up a Java update. Bam! <laughs> right on the seventh day. I, and I don't know how you can do that. I went and sat down like, and here's the next seven days. I sat down the desk. I look back and I'm like, I can't even take that down because then I have to go, ah, oh, I have to get up on it. So usually I just apologize. It's like, and if you want a job to update, you know, I mean, there's not a lot you can do. I have wrapped the cord around my ankle. I've had my heel break off. I've missed a hit only one time. I have gone over considerably. I have burped on the air. I've had a laughing fit, a coughing fit. I had something come up my nose, a chew. Uh, I had the microphone go out, and when I walked to the desk, the director, what a filthy person he was, he's like, just lean over and get the one from under the desk. Well, I did. I do wear undergarments. I had a bra on, but, you know, the blouse is there, and then he takes a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, everything, and, and you know what I finally learned is, it doesn't matter. If the train is off the tracks, it's so much easier to look at the public and go, you know what, the train is totally off the tracks. I go sit down, shut your eyes, the computer just died, I'll just tell you what the step is. Is. And you can imagine it. I'm a good storyteller, and that suffices. You know, the public so appreciates that. If you let them in, you hide the little things. Mind you, you hide them, and nobody sees them. Really, they know. Maybe my husband, but usually not even that. But the big things, you know, if you see something going on on TV, and you're just holding your breath, you're like, oh. and you're getting stressed as a viewer, and then the person on TV is getting stressed, and everybody's stressed. It's supposed to be easier to go like, off the tracks, sit back, enjoy the ride. It's crazy, and so. 
pretty much nothing. I mean, I am called on the last minute. I'm called on to cut. I'm called on to tease. I don't care if the graphic isn't ready. I just kind of roll past it. This this happened recently, right? To the guy in Tulsa, where he the computer. Oh, he held up a piece of paper. He threw out his seven day on yeah. a piece of paper and held it up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a really creative way, right? You just do what you have to do. Guy in Boston, the lights went out. They had the big storm. Lights went out, and he's like, "The oh, lights just went out." But I'm just going to keep talking because when they come back on, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I want you to know. So I mean, that was that was fairly great. At some point, you're just confident in yourself. That doesn't mean I'm good. It just means I'm confident that I can just do whatever I'm doing. And if y'all buy it, you do. If you don't, whatever. So um, there you go. But no, I don't get nervous. I guess I'm old. <laughs> so you were in Chico for a while? And then I was. I was in Chico for uh, about a year and a half. Then I went to Milwaukee, and I was there for just under three years. And then I came to Chicago. It's usually not a path that goes that quickly or that much. But what's so funny is when I was in California, um, my agent said, like I at that time got an agent, you shouldn't always have an agent. But I have a sister, oh by the way, I have a sister who's a meteorologist also. We were the only two siblings that did weather nation anywhere in the nation together at the same time. We've never worked at the same station, although we have done live shots for our stations, ironically. Um, opposite stations, opposite affiliations, which was even funnier. Uh, and we did work for the same company. We were both the chief meteorologists for Ganet at the same time, for in Sacramento and Tampa. Anyway, um, the, the bottom line is, is I had an agent who was her agent, and he said, where would you like to go? And I said, like, all these places. And the only thing I did is he said, now, how do you feel about the upper Midwest? I'm like, oh, I am not going to go to New Bay. I am not going to go to Detroit. Nowhere really cold. Nowhere really, like, you know, I am not going to Minneapolis. I am not going to Wausau. I am not going to Marquette. I am not. I listed every single place, well, except Chicago, because I'd be crazy to say no to Chicago, but then they were never going to take me at that point yet. So I listed every place but Milwaukee, and they called an offer really job. So I went back and fell in love with Milwaukee, and that's where I was, and I loved working in Milwaukee. I learned so much. My choices were, at that point, when I chose a station from my first, second, third station, I chose it based on the equipment and the chief meteorologist who was somebody I could learn from learn something, whether it's how to, how to behave in the business, whether it's the, just the weather itself, whether it's how to build graphics. Um, and that was wonderful. And so anyway, then from Milwaukee, I came to Chicago with the MEC, and then Fox, and then Tampa, and then back to Fox. So that's when I have 17 years I've been doing this. I think that's long enough. And some people think it's too long. I should stop saying that. Apparently, you need to be 28 and really gorgeous. So I was saying we do it three years, and I get a little old and tired. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, more questions? I mean, it, you guys. I mean, you guys have the the group. You guys have the the, the club. Okay, yes, okay. yes. Um, you already kind of touched on it. Your uh, box has that nice little Doppler dual goal radar of our own. Yeah. You've had it. When, when did you guys have that installed? That was the first time I was at Fox, so that was in 2007, 2006. It hasn't been that long. Was it dual pole out the gate? No. Um, it was a dual pole, uh, but the, the full H class wasn't, it wasn't capable yet. Okay. They were still Barron's. Barron's radar down in Huntsville, Alabama, they're a wonderful company, by the way. They're family owned. They're one of the only weather vendor companies family owned. They basically have built their, their foundation upon the radar business, and they did all the upgrades to the WSRs nationwide um, to make them all dual call. And um, I've done a, a number of conferences. I actually had Bob come in and do uh, do some short courses and stuff on dual poll, but the practicality of it. Because the first dual poll course I took, I took with a professor out of Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, okay. And um, that was at an AMS conference and somebody else had set it up and it was all on theory. <laughs> I, I mean, even you guys would be hard pressed to sit there and listen to eight hours of theory on dual pull. I went to a short course in Albuquerque and Red Art. It was like, what is going on? We were eyes bleeding. Oh, yeah. Because seriously, I think everybody was afterward. It, it was just like, and then the last 20 minutes of the eight hours, they showed, like, its uses, its practicals. <laughs> and everybody was like, oh, we can. That's what it's for. Um, but since then, um, we've had several workshops that have been really valuable. And Zoolpole really is, it is such an amazing tool uh, to use. I don't 
show it on air that often because, again, the explanation of what I'm seeing and what I'm analyzing doesn't always translate well. But actually, the products that they're putting out now um, with dual, dual pole are better looking for on air. Originally, just a raw data, which is like a hot mess. And you really had to look at it now. You put that on the air, it looks like a. Um, but now the other stuff, it's, it's, it's much cleaner. They're actually you now cleaning it up and making it more broadcast worthy. So, so you, is like hydrometer classification that one that you use? Mm, I haven't used that one as much. I, I have a little bit, you know, where the hail is, because generally, you know, when you've got the hail, you've got intense lightning, or generally you're going to end up having a microburst at some point, especially when you have the microburst coming through, like, Carol's stream and all of that last year. I used it a little bit then. <coughs> a lot of times I'll just go into, you know, velocity mode and show that, but now I can combine that. And I'll take snapshots, because I don't, if it happens in the afternoon and I'm not on for four hours, Sometimes the data it, it isn't as good, or the data will only run for three hours or six hours, and then I'll, I'll, I'll lose it. So I'll take snapshots to be able to go back and show on air what was going on at the time. I like it to the public. I like doing that. But um, yeah, our dual pole is, is wonderful. NBC also has a radar when I was there. Um, live Doppler 5. <laughs> it's so confusing. I don't know how many times I've said the wrong thing in the wrong place. Um, theirs was one of only two that Kavoris built. And um, so there'll be no other one like that. And they are out in Naperville on a North Aurora Road. Ours is out off of the 355 in Lockport. It's a top of the water tower. It's like a temple on top of the water tower. Um, CBS has a really old one. Um, no, but what is it? Is yes. it like an enterprise or something? Or a uh, it's a, they put it up in Plainfield. It's we, 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 talk, we teach this in class because they put it in Plainfield after the Plainfield tornado to say, we're protecting the people of Plainfield. Mm -hmm. But the code of silence, that's, that's the worst place to go. Well, yeah, now here, here's the funny thing is, before we put ours in, they, they went around, they actually come out, Barron's was, and they, they go through the entire area. You have to remember, you want to cover most of the population. So you want to be able to, because if you're going to be, if you're going to have a short beam going out 30 or 60 miles, you're not going to stick this thing out in the in the South Peru, because you're not going to hit the population base in Cook County. Your beam's going to be above it all. So you're wanting to kind of, you're wanting to put it in a place where you can hit most of the area. Because I know we all say, we could think of being go out, we'll hit six states. Well, yeah, you can. You can't see what's out in that state, but, you know, because it's, because, yeah, because you're hitting a jet, <laughs> but exactly. Um, yeah, so to flip it into the different modes and, and everything. Um, but the <coughs> best place with the most advantageous elevation and clear view of everything is out there in the southwest suburbs. That's why everybody is out there. Because the Weather Service tried to get us to put ours up north by Arlington Heights, which was a secondary location choice. But the problem with putting it there is you miss northwest Indiana. And they get a lot of activity in northwest Indiana. Um, the beam just wasn't wasn't able to quite do as much there. So that's why they had everybody out there in the cluster to correct foreign people of Plainfield, Joliet, and of course. And the rest of us. I wish I wish they could put it. They could have put it somewhere else, but they didn't. So, but it, they they had to find out. Yes, in the three fifty five. Yeah, I don't know how you can miss it. <sighs> so I know you don't use the dual pole on air at all, but how much of that do you have on? Like, is that publicly available on the website or? Not yet. I'm hoping that that we can. Um, but the thing is, is that in order for us to, yeah, as they make products that are. Um, more viewable by the public that, that are that are you know they're actually yeah. just they're taken care of so that they are more explanatory they're cleaned up cleaned up um, stuff we will put those on the website and they're just starting to put those out you know with their, it's with their sad. It's like, I can't look at the radar see what they got. I just but the public but the, no but you yeah, can't right. I can't I can look at both but if you're explaining something to the public and you have got clutter everywhere you're looking at the level two, you're looking at, you know, Especially you're not looking the, at the... the new new pole stuff. That's, that's stuff is really just messy and raw. You're absolutely right. Yeah, you see a, you see a pinpoint in the, in the middle of it, like a bright spot, <laughs> and that's what you're pixeling. That's what you're querying. That's what you're looking at. Um, and to explain that, oh, look at this, this whole thing, and see this dot? Come on over here. See this dot right here? <laughs> if I did that, the public would be like my now. Uh, so. do, you, do you guys all do it? I've used it more. No, I use it. No, more not more. on the air, but I mean off here when you're doing your. I uh, use it. Mark really uses it. Bill doesn't use it so much. I I, I use it. I love doing it. Um, I'll look at it. If there's something going on, I'll look at it. 
I think the thing is, is you have to be there when there's something going on, or it has to have just gone on for you to be able to, to go back and look at it in time. Um, it doesn't help the day, a day later. I have to dial Bear and stuff, and I have to say, can you load the stuff from yesterday? And then... Do they are happening to those Okay, just curious. You could actually do a triple Doppler dual analysis. If you had, a, you could use Romeoville Midway. Mm -hmm. Use O'Hare. But there's another trip. Well, that, the but radar they, they don't have dual pull at the terminal radar sites at, at O'Hare. No, no, no. But, but you could do a dual Doppler load with Lockport if you okay, had yeah, a yeah. radar, which yeah. would be really, really neat. In fact, when we first got our dual pull, we actually gave the web service our raw data. We had to deal with them, so they could take it and they could analyze it if they wanted. And there's been plenty of times I've called up the guys at the weather service and I. I've said, look, I'm seeing this, but you're not putting out a warning yet what's going on. And they're like on the cusp of doing it. And especially if, if I'm seeing it too, because the Bar Barron's has different algorithms than they're it's using. Different probably band um, even though, yeah, oh, it's a totally different band radar, yeah. But the thing is, is that if I'm getting something and they're not, or if I see something and, and I, you know, it's questioned, a lot of times, you know, they're on the cusp of pulling the trigger. I'm just really not going to issue a warning over them. That's, that's craziness because then you have confusion. But, you know, I'll always point out and say this is really worth watching. But my station won't even go on the air unless there's a warning that's been issued. So that's why it's like mm -hmm. get that warning issued with my guys. So yeah. But no, um, hopefully we can show more and more on air, get it on our website. Right now we have an interference issue. I don't know if you've seen our radar and the one at channel five. There's like a beam that goes out across the lake. Mm -hmm. um, it's a spike. There is something after the storms came through, after the derecho came through the end of June. Um, and then burned up all the T1 lines and everything, and everything went back online. Somebody powered up a, an antenna downtown, and there's an interference. And so now the um, FCC is doing uh, research to figure out who it is because that spike is there, and it doesn't it doesn't extend from Lockport to downtown. It's once you get downtown and going across the lake. So somebody is on a frequency that they powered up afterward, and, and so now we have that ugly spike going across the lake. Okay. <laughs> I hate doing that on the air. I have to explain what it is because otherwise somebody will think there's something crazy going on. Yeah. It's incoming! Yeah. It's incoming! Yeah. So. Any more questions? How many people even have considered a career in broadcast meteorology? Really? Yes, you're definitely very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm going into broadcast. So. Good. It's fun. It really is fun. And um, the thing is, is make yourself as marketable as possible. Do as much as you can do. They are going to market the program here more. They're going to have all kinds of things we're, to offer we're nationally. We're going to be on air once a week, <laughs> dancing in the I'll, I'll, I'll wear a green outfit. They're so tired. I'll just put my face in. <laughs> <laughs> He's so tired of hearing, hearing me say that. But, but make yourself marketable as far as learning things because news directors who, Nine out of ten, ten news directors don't give a whit about They don't understand it. They don't care. They just want, do you look good? Do you smile good? Can you talk good? Yeah. And are you excited to watch? Do you pop off the screen when you're talking? Or are you like, eh, 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 And then they're like, no, forget it. Yeah, I'm actually good friends with uh, Brian Wilkes down at Fox 59. Mm -hmm. Indy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's always telling me, do this, this, and this if you want to be good at broadcast. Yeah, and just basically try to be yourself, too. Yeah. Enjoy what you're doing. You're, you're serious when you have to be serious. I'm mm -hmm. serious. I get serious way too easily. Right. But, um, you know, have some fun when you can have fun. Yeah. I have a lot of fun on the morning show. I dance. So I, I stay. It's <laughs> 5.30 in the morning. Come on. It's cold. There's nothing going on. It's cold. And the anchors are like, it is dangerously cold out there. No, I'm like, yeah, it is in Chicago. <laughs> it's only dangerous if you don't cover up and you're naked for 30 minutes and you got cross vibration. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean it is. It is because there's people that don't think about it and pass and then hey, this is the news business. It's dangerously cold. Wait, we've got breaking news. There's a seventh floor fire at the sixty five hundred block oh, yeah, of, of uh, Lakeshore Drive, and so they've got the apartments going, they have people out on the balconies and their park is, you know, because the power's off and it's and it's a three alarm fire and then all of a sudden and those people wait, we have breaking news, let's pan down from Fox Oh, there's a dog on the ice on the lake. They spend more time on that damn dog. And I'm happy about it. I love dogs. But this dog can run out there on the ice, which has just formed, and he's sitting out there. And he's way out there. And now, of course, they have to call the the police uh, the police boat unit, the police water unit, or, or the fire water unit, whatever rescue to get the dog. 
which is only going to cost like a million dollars, right? I mean, but that's fine. And nobody wants to see the dog fall through the ice and drown. That would be really horrible. So I, I don't know. That was the lead. They got the dog, not the fire, not the cold. They got the dog, and they showed it because it was a great video. So that is what you can compete against. So I like to show video. I showed video the other night of it was um, 41 below. I think you guys probably all saw this video in um, Siberia. And the guy that like shows his iPhone, and he lives in a really nice complex. I didn't know they even had nice apartment complexes in Siberia. <laughs> I don't even know why he wants to live in Siberia, but he lives in this really nice like building, and he's on the seventh floor. And he goes over, he goes park it. He opens the door. You know, there's steam and kind of cold, and and then he picks up the pot of boiling water and he goes out and he throws it off the balcony, right? And turns the ice and stuff. And then there's a reverse shot on the ground because, of course, you know, everybody's got an iPhone in Siberia. That was amazing. <laughs> First of all, I'm telling the, the editor, make sure you get the iPhone. Because in my mind, I'm like, I don't think anybody would think that somebody in Siberia has an iPhone. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, so I try to show video or pictures whenever I can, like snapshots. I have a whole bunch of websites that I go to. And I'm working with the people at um, climatecentral.org very closely on, on climate stories and climate change. And they have a lot of wonderful stories and pictures. And, um, so they have a lot of great information. So that's part of it. Show pictures. It's a it's a visual business. Show pictures and video when you can and when it's appropriate, um, because people like seeing that. And tornado. Oh, just the more tornadoes, the better. You can't show enough tornadoes seriously. I, I don't even producers love it. You know, you can just pretend it's a tornado. I don't want to show. It. <laughs> do you like together your own thing? Like do you edit it and all that, or does editor do that? How does that work? For like video and pictures. And um, well, because this is a union town, I did it in other markets, but because this is a union town, I can't. Now, if it's a snapshot, sure, I import that into my own computer and I do that. So if you see a still image of a snapshot, I do that. I do not wait around for somebody else to do that. I have to take, you know. Um, but if it is video, no, there's an editor that will, they'll just, you know, I'll tell them where it is and what I want, and then they'll just kind of cut it and then put it into the rundown. And I call for it. Um, but yeah, no, we're not allowed to touch the video editor. <laughs> that's, that's a big, uh, yeah. Does like you said you create your own graphics, but do you guys have like a graphics program like from Weather Central or something? We have WSI or? and we have Barron. So we have okay. the Omni, the Viper, the Fast Track. Right. Then we have the Max, and we're getting the the, the Titan Storm to go with Max. Oh, yeah. I use that down in Tampa, mm -hmm. um, and so we have that. And we have cameras and um, a number of other things. We're off of the Linux system basically and, and we have also the weather prism to feed the web so I'm building graphics for that. Okay. So they, they have the basic like you know the satellite radar information mm -hmm. but you can choose it. You can choose your color table. Um, you can choose you know the satellite shot you want. Is it you know mm -hmm. whole hemisphere? Is it just US basically just North America? You can get a high def, uh, you can get a infrared and a, a visible combo that will go from the visible during the day to go into the uh, infrared at night. Okay. Um, and so, but you still have to build your base map, you have to add your cities, you have to add your road. So for that, you do that. Anything else you want to build, if you want to build a surface map, mm -hmm. fronts, lows, uh, anything else you want to add to it, you have to do your viewpoints. Okay. I, had a, I had a lot of fun doing the, doing the temperatures the last few days, because I, you know, I love showing Alaska is warmer than here. And I, so I started with the temperatures, I had to load them all up and figure out where everything was in Alaska, I mean Alaska, in Canada. Do you know they have a little Chicago in Canada? It's up in the Northwest Territories. I don't even know why somebody would name a little Chicago. It's not like Chicago. And they have a Wrigley up there, too. So it was kind of fun showing those temperatures and showing that and then scanning down to the uh, upper Midwest and scanning to locally and showing, you know, what the forecast models were, were kind of putting out. So. Mm -hmm. so there's still, you still have to build a lot. You can go with the basic can show. I have one of those that's called mm -hmm. emergency day. Mm -hmm. Car breaks down, somebody is sick, I have to run in and I don't even have time to put makeup on. And that's scary enough to try to build a show, you know, just, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have one of those as well. But you try to always do a little bit more for your story and it kind of makes it up, whatever the story of the day is. Gotcha. So. Tammy, um, full-time anchors, mm -hmm. uh, do they obtain like benefits of health insurance and that from the station or is that for the union? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a full-time employee. All the employees pretty much on air, I think, at Fox are full-time. I don't think we have any freelancers. I'm um, in sports. Like Dan Jacobs is freelancing once in a while when he comes into sports. But um, our benefits are through the union. But generally, like when I was in Florida, 
you could buy your insurance through the through the station. That, that was a Gannett-owned station. Um, so you, do, you have benefits. Every the stations are owned either by the ONOs, Fox, CBS, ABC, NBC, or they're owned by a station group: Tribune, Velo, Scripps, Howard, Hearst, Argyle, Gannett, um, and they'll all have a number of stations too, with different affiliations. So depending on where you work, you might be working for a Gannett or a Hearst Argyle, or if you're in one of the major cities, it's likely to be what's called an ONO, which is owned and operated by the mothership. Well, well, right, do they? look at your political views when they're hiring it's but you, you know because i was wondering about other areas in the stations too like they're just looking at you as a meteorologist yeah no i mean we have very conservative people that work at that fox station and we have very liberal people that work at the fox station in chicago and then we have a bunch of people in the middle of the road i think that they're more concerned with you actually um with you saying something inappropriate or putting something out there that would be insulting to a group or um, that would be just in, just inappropriate. You know, I'm glad to hear that because I always sort of assume they, they want to cater, they want to hire to, and I'm glad to hear all. that they don't. Yeah, and there's a struggle with the local Fox station because people, pers they, they presume that, but right. that's not the case. Is It is actually a station that reflects the community views. Yeah. If anything, the Fox in Chicago is surprisingly more liberal yeah. um, because Chicago as a city is a more liberal city. Right. So, you know, so they follow, they kind of follow that. You look totally bored. What's on your list? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> you do. You're no, yawning. No, no, you're I checking was, your watch. Was, you're all like it. I was going to ask them um, <laughs> what got you started in, I, in broadcast. Oh, I, you know what, I, in the broadcast part or meteorology? Well, no, because you, I mean, that's fine. It's, you said you did that as an You know what, what yeah, I mean, the, the meteorology part, I, I've always, I've always loved it. I love outside and I love science. I think probably the broadcast part of it, I, I've always had a knack for talking. Um, when I was in college, I, I modeled, I did, you know, um, plays. I, I was part of a, um, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Groundlings at all. It's like a yeah. second city, but it's in LA. There's a whole bunch of famous people that came out of that that went to Saturday Night Live as well. But, you know, I did that, that type of stuff and I enjoyed it. Um, my sister got into the broadcast part of it before I did. Um, not weather. She actually went in with a communications degree, and then she went back and took all the weather stuff. And I thought that it would be really something that I would enjoy. So that's why I pursued it. I don't know. I would get the gap. I like doing it. I like talking to people. I like solving the puzzle each and every day. You have to solve it. You can't put it off to ah, I'm not going to do my forecast today. I'll finish it tomorrow. It's not, you know, we've got to do it then, and you kind of see the fruits of your labor. And some days are really nice, and some days are crazy. At the station, it can be crazy when there's severe weather, and I'm by myself, and I'm running the radar, and I'm trying to get on the chat room, and I'm trying to answer emails, and I'm trying to do cut-ins, and I'm trying to update the website, and I'm doing it by myself. It's crazy. It is crazy. You an intern. I would love to have an intern, and, I had, and I've had a couple of them that were really, really good. <laughs> See, I mean, the thing is, is that, and that would put your thinking down there. The, the problem is, is that they're not always there when the weather is hitting. They're in school or, you know, they're, they're not always there every day. Unless we know we're going to have severe weather. And then we can set it up ahead of time to be there. Hey, you mentioned earlier, when I was in grad school, I took a broadcast course. And so you have all these broadcast majors. And the teacher said, can you explain weather? Because they didn't know anything. So I gave them like a 45 minute lecture in here's an L means low pressure, you know, real basic stuff. And then our one assignment was to do a three minute weather cast. Because everybody always asks, are they scripted? And no, no, it's not. Yeah. And all these new casters, who, newscasters who were really proficient at reading the scripts, they looked great, they were to this. They sat in front of the weather board and freaked out. They didn't know what to do. No one could talk. 30 seconds would go by. They'd look at the board and just not know what to say. I bet you were brilliant, though. Well, I could do my, I could get my marks. I think you <laughs> No, I, I, cause you're, cause you're very comfortable in front of the camera and you're very comfortable having a conversation and talking and you're an educator and so you stand here and do that. Yeah, so you know what it's like. It's, it, yeah. It, it's very much, you do. You just kind of talk about what you want to say. Try to remember that the audience is not 
I would long never forget still when he showed streamlining analysis loop. And he says, look at this low pressure area moving across the Midwest. And I couldn't even tell what it was. They were going too fast. I'm like, yeah. what is going on? There's no L's and H's. It was just streamlined loop. And I'm like, what? That's, well, sometimes I don't. I don't always. I put in less surface features many times. I used to build everything. I mean, I would have the front, have the bow. I would have like a low level jet. I had the back around. I would have, you know, I would be so cluttered. And at some point, I, I looked at it one day and I'm like, I, I can't even tell what's going on. There's way too much on that map. <laughs> and then I'd have to point out every feature and what it's doing. So I started paring it down. And if it's something pretty significant, I'll put that in there. But I've learned to use words more. And I, you know, many times I'll point it. You know, if we have, if we have like the, the ice of ours, I'll point it. Okay, here's where the high pressure is. You can clearly see it. There's the circle, and and it's very clear. Sometimes I'll put it in there. Sometimes I won't. Uh, sometimes I'll just go with the with the forecast model, and you can actually clearly see ahead of a front coming in or the clouds developing and things. It's kind of gotten to the point now where it's really, if you point out what they're looking at, you can do it. I love Tom when he does all that, though. But he does, boy, he goes through those maps fast. <laughs> it's quick, it's quick. Can I ask you something about what is life like as a celebrity? What's the celebrity side of your job? I don't, you know what, I don't, I don't really pay attention to it. I don't. I don't know. I have a four-year-old, and I and my husband, and I don't. I don't. I don't know. I go out sometimes, and I I still have makeup on and off from this morning, and I'm sorry if it's like sliding off and it's resembling Alice Cooper at this hour. But um, you know, I don't like to wear a lot of makeup when I go out. You want to tell who Alice Cooper is? Bath, birdcage, and I'm not talking about the big tornado. I'm talking about the okay. Um. Anyway, um, a lot of times, uh. I'll just go, you know, I'll go with no makeup. Or I have really, my hair is very similar to yours. I have naturally curly hair. So I blow dry it really straight. Sometimes I wear it straight, flat iron, or I don't know what's really now. It's a little bit of curl in it. But I go through all this, right? So I'll just go out with my hair like that, putting a ponytail, and people recognize me. And then I'm a little self-conscious because I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> I don't have any makeup on. I look like a mess, I, you know. But, I mean, I don't care. And they're always nice. People always say, you look better than you look on TV. Now, if I have my makeup on and stuff, I'll take it as a compliment. If I don't, and no, your hair looks beautiful, but what I'm saying is it just doesn't look like me when I have it all curly. I, I will be like, oh, thank you so much. Tim. Go look in the mirror. I'm like, oh. <laughs> That's a mess. Um, so usually, I don't pay much attention to it. My husband, when we're out like at Costco or something, he says sometimes people will turn around or whatever. And I'll have people come up to me. And they'll say hi, or I like your weather forecast, or you look just like the weather lady, you know. And I'll say, oh my God, <laughs> I am. Um, and but you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't use it. I know there's some people that will, I don't use it um, for reservations and stuff. I don't, I don't use it for perks. Um, and I have a four-year-old, so I mean, the biggest insult of all. Let me tell you, he goes to a, a preschool. And the, the one lady that is one of the two that runs the preschool is so enamored with Paul Conrad that <laughs> she asked me one day, can you get Paul Conrad to come in and read a weather story to the kids? And I looked at her, I'm like, no, I'll be happy to do that, but no, I'm not going to call Paul, ask him to haul his ass out to Oak Brook. And read, I don't even know Oak Brook, I live in Little Brook, but he goes to school in Oak Brook. Haul his ass out to Oak Brook and read a weather story when I can do it just as well. So, you know, I mean... You just gotta put it in perspective. If I wasn't on television, nobody would give a crap who I was. I would be Caleb's mom. I would be Greg's wife. You know. And my kid, he know, you know, my married name is Hendrix. It's not Susa. That's my maiden name. So the funny thing is, is that because Caleb would watch me on TV when I was working, he picked us up at the age of two and a half. He'd be walking around going, "My mommy is Tammy Souza. She works at Fox." And I was actually kind of horrified. <laughs> I was a little embarrassed um, that I had a two and a half year old name proper. So we dialed that all back now, and this is the dinosaurs. <laughs> um, <laughs> generally, people are nice. Every now and then, you get people that are uh, a little creepy. Um, I just try to be nice, and I don't let it bother me. I, I have had stalkers before. I think everybody in the business has stalkers at some point. Um, they, uh, I don't know, I've had a guy send me his birth certificate, and then he was going to come out and kill me. And, 
uh, the Secret Service has been involved because he was going to kill me and the president. So then, of course, I'm going to kill you and the president. Oh, so I turned the letter over to you know, HR, and then they turned it to the police, who immediately, you know, up will start. Life question. Um, but, yeah. You get bank calls or answer your emails? or? Oh, I get tons of emails, yeah. I try to answer them all, but sometimes it gets away from me. Facebook is a little bit easier sometimes, um, and Twitter. Um, and then stuff goes to spam. <laughs> we, we went back and forth, back and forth. I don't know. Like, I sent you one, you sent me one, and it went spam. Um, all of the papers that you should go to spam. <laughs> you also <laughs> go to spam. <laughs> no. But, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I You know what? I get recognized, but I guess I don't pay attention to it, and I don't even, I, I'm oblivious. I am oblivious, but I don't think I get recognized like like stealing or something. Um, obviously, um, yeah. Did you have weather titles or people you emulated as you were growing up? Or I was in San Diego. Uh -huh. My weather idol was uh, Bob Dale. Um, let me see. What well, was John Coleman? <laughs> he is now. See, he was my. That, <laughs> Sorry. He was my. That was who I wanted to be. Yeah. No, he's out there. He doesn't believe in climate change. Go to NASA. Go to that. Okay. <clears throat> you just sit down and have a talk with him. Um, yeah, I always enjoyed watching the weather people. I was born in Pittsburgh. I grew up in San Diego, though. Um, but I always wanted, I, I, maybe it's because I grew up in San Diego, and I've never gone back there to take a job. I've had an offer at every station there. Didn't go back, not because it's not a beautiful place to live, but I love it here, and I love the change of seasons. And we grow up, and every year, it's just sort of like the same thing. Thanksgiving is 70, sometimes it's 85, and you're water skiing on Christmas. It's just wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. So my whole life, I wanted to have change of seasons, and boy, oh, how you did I get it. So um, I don't know. I mean, I enjoyed watching the weather people. They were a lot more flamboyant, though. It was all men, practically. I mean, the women, there's still only 20% of the people doing weather on television are women. Only 20%. And I was fortunate to have been a chief meteorologist twice. So for a female to be a chief twice, is even more remarkable because there aren't very many of them. I can tell you Gannett is the most proactive company. They had six at one point, six female chiefs, which is outstanding. Um, but it is, it is a hard place to go because they want to put women on in the morning because it's so perky and on the weekend. And, um, you know, it, it's hard. But I grew up watching all men do the weather. I've always patterned my weather somewhat after men because I learned from men. Men were my chiefs. Um, and I, it's a man's world. So I try to keep my feminine side and my sense of humor, but I actually pattern my seriousness, no, my seriousness, my seriousness after the way men do their weather casts. I don't, I, I don't think I have. Okay, I probably have a weather buddy thing, but not a whole lot, except for those pink shorts. She saw the pink shorts. I didn't see the pink shorts, but I was on YouTube. <laughs> this is something you should never do. My last day at Fox before I went to Tampa. I, I was on the morning show with Crazy Mark Bars and, and Jan, and uh, everybody was nice and got along. So they had a huge going away party for me, and they gave me gifts. They gave me a Bears t shirt, they gave me a Cubs hat, and they gave me some pink shorts that said White Sox on them. And I don't know if any of you remember, because this was like four and a half, five years ago, um, Mariah Carey had just thrown out the first pitch of the Cubs game. And she wore the tiniest little pink shorts with these giant high heels, and she just walked out there and like this. <laughs> and so uh, it was 15 minutes before the end of the morning show. It was quarter to 10 in the morning, and, I, and the anchors dared me to put all that on. So I did. So I put on the little shorts, and I was in much better shape than I am now, thank God. And I put on the T-shirt, and I had the hat. And I came out, and I did my last forecast in. It's just for fun. It's a morning show, for God's sake. So you can have some fun, right? And I'm saying goodbye. And so I did that, and, and I, then I did a little Mariah Carey walk, and I even said it on air. I feel like for Mariah Carey, I feel so weird, like, oh, you know. So then I go to Tampa to take a job trying to not fill the shoes of a legend, but just to kind of get in there and update the weather office. I mean, he was a legend, so there's no replacing the legend. But all they see down there is, this is the cupcake you're getting from Chicago in these pink shorts. And so for the rest of my career, that will haunt me. That's a lesson learned. I can have a sense of humor. I don't mind dancing on the air. I don't care if it's a morning show, and I'll justify it. But those damn pink shorts will haunt me forever. <laughs> and I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I've done all this. I, I am a serious meteorologist. I have done my college work. I have gotten my skills. I have headed national committees. I have 
sat down and talked with Craig Fugate and Mike Brown after he got fired. I have done all this, and still. <laughs> there you go. How's that for celebrity? <laughs> and with that, <laughs> Tammy, thank you so much for coming here. Oh, it's my pleasure. And we'll see you again on, on March 16th. She'll be emceeing our Super Weather uh, at Dance Spot Training with us. Yeah, Thank you. Well. <laughs>